All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started here because we're starting to run over time. For those of you who have just signed in, um, I'm asking everyone to take a, a minute to open up the chat box and to let that um, pull and draw down to all participants, put your name in your institution in a discussion box, and then click send to make sure that you can use that feature because that's how we'll be talking to each other today. So if you want to practice with that, that would be great. And ahead and get it started. I appreciate you all um, being here and, and um, taking the time to do this. My intention today is to open some conversations. I do not have all of the answers. I never have all of the answers, I promise. And um, but I know that there's lots of questions that need to be addressed. And really, a lot of what I'm after is what are the questions. So we we talked for a very long time about this. And I know that there's some people who were included in that conversation early on and some who are coming into it relatively um, lately. And um, that's kind of the way these things work. It's, it would be difficult to have everyone at the table as we're developing. But um, what we need to do, what I would like to do and to make sure that happens as we're moving forward is that we have a good open dialogue that's running so that we can know if there are questions, concerns, issues, um, kudos would be nice, but um, if, if things are... Um, problem from your viewpoint, which is why we're doing these chats today, um, from, from your workplace, from your desk, what, what are the problems, what are the concerns, what are the things that are working, what are the things that need to be shifted or changed. So keep in mind that, that this is a dialogue, it's not a, it's a, you know, I, I call it Q&A, but it doesn't, it's not, there's not always going to be an A. And what we'll be doing when we get to the point where we're talking is to be asking some of you to help with the answers. So. Um, um, just so that you might get put on the spot, and I might click in and say, you know, do you have a, a thought on that? Um, we have gone pretty deep into um, working on, um, on the questions for a little bit. We've gone pretty deeply into um, working on the new coding and working on those kinds of things with the registrars, but there's a lot of things that are still in process or that are close to being ready to roll out. So there's a lot to be um, determined. So anyway, so get forward here. I'm going to talk for just a few minutes, and then I'm going to um, open us up for, for discussion. So um, just to focus the pieces of the policy that are most impactful um, for all of you, the students are no longer required to earn credit in residency prior to transcripting PLA credit. Um, you who signed on on Monday or Tuesday for the intro um, learned about this. Um, remove that one residency, uh, requ one credit requirement because we didn't see that there was a real um, reason for it other than concern about what students' uh, decision might be about coming to school or not coming to school. But there's a lot of data to support that it was something that was um, good for the students. It was more, it was something for us to um, kind of control things. Um, students must be admitted to the institution and must declare a program of study is in the policy. So a student can't just say, I want to get this credit. Um, and I want to get my, my learning assessed and um, I don't know what I want to do. It's not going to work the way they have to have chosen a program of study. PLA credit must apply to the declared program of study. Um, best practice suggests courses should be from the CCNS as much as possible, avoiding excessive elective credit. And that's part of the conversation, especially when it comes to talking about the ACE credits um, and military, um, where we want to really start focusing ourselves on making sure that what we're transcripting for the student is actually going to serve the student in the long term. The, we can see in terms of how the procedures are working is the changes to the PLA coding. Those of you who are registrars have seen this already. It was pushed out from Janelle's office um, earlier in the summer. And um, we've made a, you know, tweaked a little, a few things. And there was also a glossary of terms that was sent out to you, which I can also send out to anyone who wants it. Um, actually, I'll, I'll plan on sending it out um, with information that I'll be pushing out at the beginning of next week. But essentially what that was was the, the list of the new codes and what the descriptors are. Um, we're going to be using a dashboard. Um, we, we've, we are in the process of creating a dashboard that's an interactive uh, website, essentially. It's not going to live on your servers. It'll be a look off of your website. Um, I've already worked with your um, communications folks to try to get it onto your front pages. And it'll essentially be a button that says, um, no. I'd like to see if I can earn credit for what I already know or something like that. And they click on it and it takes them into this dashboard, which is essentially a, a survey, a questionnaire of different things. But they enter information about their prior learning assessment credit. So um, they might have, have class transcripts that they enter information from. They may have JST transcripts, and we ask for specific information that will go into this. 
point of it is to um, collate and collect the, the information that has to do with their PLA um, opportunities on page, what we're calling the PLA report, and then at the end of the process of entering this stuff in, they can then click and send it to whomever institution designates as the person who should receive it. So maybe that it goes to your advising department. It may be that you prefer to have it go to your transcript evaluator. Um, you get to decide who do you want that to go to or whom. You know, it could be more than one person. Um, and um, then you then take the responsibility of getting them involved in whatever your particular system is on the ground. So if what happens is you get them into a transcript evaluator first and then they see an advisor, whatever that, that system might look like. Um, the whole point of that is to help the students to collect the information and to have that long advising conversation before they come to the advisor so that they can um, minimize the amount of work involved. So have a new standardized test matrix that was pushed out to all of you um, last month, I believe it was October, September, October, um, which is in place and is being used and um, has actually been pretty welcome from what I've heard. I haven't heard a lot of negatives about it yet. Um, and that is in place until CDHE makes its decisions about what the new statewide standardized test matrix will look like. And now what I see from that is that they're going to take some, um, excuse me, they're going to take some things to the con in December, but I will <clears throat> that they'll have it ready in December or as they, you know, they had initially said that, I think it's going to be their talk about it being ready in the spring. I think that it will be good if we have it by the end of spring semester. But in interim, we are authorized by leadership to use this um, this matrix until we know differently. Subject matter expert approval of credit crosswalks is a big part of this. It's included in the in the policy. It's the changes that we made to coding it has to do with that fact that in this policy, a subject matter expert has to review. Um, it doesn't mean that a subject matter expert has to review every single time. It means that at least once for whatever the credential is, it has to be reviewed to walk to a CCNS course. And I'll talk a little bit more about that problem. We're creating the PLA matrix in an ongoing fashion. The dashboard is built on top of the, an electronic version of the matrix. And the reasoning in that is that that matrix needs to be a dynamic um, document. It needs to be something that is constantly Add to and updated and corrected if need be so that it's always accurate for your use. That board <clears throat> is going to be capable of being entered into from either um, students that will be outwardly facing to the students, but we're also creating administrative per permissions for you to go in, for anyone to go in who's working with students, and to do things like what is that crosswalk from Kleppelish, I don't remember, and to be able to put that information in and have it pop right back out at you as a single source document so that you don't have to be searching for that information anymore. And then we're working on developing a common cost matrix so that the, partly that the students can have the same experience, but the bigger issue around this is building a fiscal structure around PLA that actually supports the activity, which has not been the case in the past. So I'm just going to go through these quickly. I'm assuming, I, you know, with what they say about assuming, I'm assuming that most of you who are on this call have had, had this information already because you would have been the ones who would be coding this into the system, but I'm just going to briefly go through, through it. That we've changed, um, it used to just be that you would see PUBG. Sky. Um, that's no longer the case. What you see now is <clears throat> a series of codes that will, um, um, essentially the reason that we did, we did a couple, this for a couple of reasons. Part because when we went into the data to try to figure out how are we currently practicing in terms of prior learning assessment credit, it, it really pretty um, varied viewpoint. The BG code for published guides was used in, um, I would say, close to 13 different ways in terms of how people interpreted what that meant. The, the subsequent information after PUG as an institutional code was always, um, was often different. Your, your institutions were consistent in terms of what you entered for your institution, but institution to institution, it was not consistent information. So instance, under the, the PBG for ACE credit, a lot of you just put in ACE. Some of you put in um, JST military codes. Some of you just put in JST. Um, there's only one institution that I can tell that actually enters um, the, the ACE um, identifiers so that we could track to say this ACE identifier crosswalks to this CNS course, which is actually the best practice that we're after. So 
things like that made, um, when Janelle and I had a lot of conversation about this, it made us look at it and say, you know, there's going to be a way that we can um, tighten up our um, opportunities for data collection and to be looking at this so that it can better serve our, our, our purposes, keeping it again that what we're trying to do is create infrastructure that, that makes this more efficient for you. So not having to go to 20 different documents or you're not having to evaluate every time someone walks in with a credential so that we stop duplicating all of this work. So having these codes in place is a big part of that, uh, um, building that infrastructure. So P is the is essentially the this is ACE credit. And typically the way that I said you should think about it is that it's ACE credit that's not on a JST. And the reason we separate them is because we want to really identify the <clears throat> excuse me, we want to identify the military codes because those then we give us the infrastructure for crosswalks. So there's PCE, and one of the things that um, Janelle and I have not finished talking about, but that will be part of what we're going to be looking at um, real soon. She should be um, back hopefully soon. But what we're looking at is um, making sure that the the places where you enter information are actually quite prescribed, more so than just what some of them that you've had where you had text um, fields to enter information into. But for instance, with the ACE credit, what you're entering in is the ACE identifier, not just ACE from ACE. Um, and that's important, again, for us to be able to code this properly and to be able to track it. So we're going to be looking at those types of things pretty here, but that's um, PACE. And the PCCC is um, for the Department of Corrections codes. Actually, those um, seem to have been kind of falling by the wayside, but we had to keep them in because they're part of the policy. Um, PL is a, um, for a challenge exam, some pretty straightforward stuff. The ST, PJST um, codes were the ones that were the most changed um, in terms of what they mean and how you're going to be doing them. And I'm going to tell you that the bottom line on why there are two different codes for this is that the play policy requires subject matter expert review. The tour policy does not. So kept JST, Joint Services Transcript, which is the second of the boxes you're looking at, um, clear as the the essential falling under the transfer policy that says this, you know, you make the determinations yourself there. And that might be where you bring in the non-crosswalk um, elective, the 999s, that kind of thing, make more sense there. And that way then we don't bump into being working against policy. You continue to transcript that credit as you choose. It's just that cleaning out this way keeps us from, from running foul of policy requirements. So the PAST requires that subject matter expert crosswalk. And, and as we're establishing these and getting them into the matrix, we're hoping that there's not going to be a huge amount of um, location. But that code then says we're putting PJST, a PJST in because we have crosswalked it to a CCNS course. And hopefully that's clear enough. And as as has always been the case, the Community College of the Air Force is a trans is a transfer credit, um, and, and it's not part of this. Um, the thing that we're looking at that we haven't finished making determinations about is things like the CLEP testing that's on a JST. My um, and you can think about this a little and maybe give me some feedback when we start talking. My feeling on that is that CLEP is CLEP, and you ought to be entering that in as a, a standardized test as PN, but um, you may have different feelings about that. So um, we we'll keep talking about that. It's for industry workplace faculty evaluation. This is new. Um, there have been opportunities all, for as long as I was at French Community College, it was happening that um, faculty would look at different types of industry training or they would, they would be working with an industry partner and they would say, okay, well, we'll give your guys six credits when they come in because we can see they're doing something here. It has been a practice. It has not been a formalized practice. And what we're trying to do is to put some parameters around that to make sure that what's going on is really um, um, default so that we say, yes, we've done a rigorous evaluation of this and we agree that the credit is crosswalked to this, which is important, a very important thing to faculty to make sure that we don't in any way down or dumb down, as some of them say, any of our curriculum in the interest of getting students credits. We need to make sure that we hold a high standard and hold a high rigor. So that particular um, particular code comes along with some requirements for those faculty as far as that goes. So um, that might be um, something like um, it could be any industry in terms of how it's coded. Essentially, it'll come in under PLOC. And we're, again, we don't have 
had said yet, but that place where you have an opportunity to add text will probably end up being about either who the faculty member was who evaluated it or which the, what the industry is, and we'll decide how that's best going to cross up. NCC is a National College Credit Recommendation Service. Not a lot of people are using that, but it's in there and it's in the policy. And there is, if there are any other types of transfer credit that's appropriately evaluated by faculty, subject matter experts, but doesn't fit in other designations. PPORT for portfolios, PCN is standardized tests, um, PRT is for your high school articulated credit. Those are pretty standard and normal, haven't changed much. Okay, so I can see that there are questions coming in already, but I want you to take a second to look at this and see how I've set it up. The way that we're going to talk for the next 40 minutes or so if you want, or however much we want to, is I'm going to ask you to write your question in the chat box and I'm going to take them as they come. And to unmute your microphone and ask you to read the question out to the group so that you can take ownership. And I'm going to ask the question um, or call on someone. I'm going to answer the question as I can, or I'm going to call in, or I'm going to call on someone in the group to help with the answer. So, um, and I'd like you to, to have some patience with me on this because this is an experiment in terms of how do you let 40 people talk. Actually, there's 21 of you in the room at the moment, so that's actually more manageable. So what I'm going to do is go up back up to the top of the chat. And I'm going to start with the first question to ask, and I'm going to ask this to as you, if you would just read your question, if you want to elaborate on it a little bit, that's great. It's kind of keep in mind that we want to make sure that everybody gets a chance. So um, the floor will be yours for a limited amount of time. <laughs> and um, let's see if my little um, idea is going to work here. So um, first question was from Tiffany Karnowski at Front Range. And to unmute you, and I would appreciate it if you would go ahead and um, ask the group or of me. Thanks very much. On um, the previous May for standardized exams, we were in dates, uh, date ranges when we could and could not use the test or that, that score. For example, if we received uh, an AP transcript with human geography taken prior to 2009, we know that that test was not yet approved approved for credit by CCCS, um, or perhaps that the test has changed, requiring a different score than previous years. The current interim matrix does not have dates associated with the test. Does this mean the test uh, would be accepted regardless of when it was administered and taken by the student? Um, and the second portion to that question, will the finalized matrix have dates? Okay, great. Thank you. Assessment committee that um, for about a year had this conversation toward the end of our conversations because we did um, talk about whether we needed to have effective dates, how they had been used in the past, and there was a lot of conversation back and forth. And one of the things that we figured out is that um, effective dates in terms of the tests were really more pertinent when, um, because of the, the things that were done in 2008 at the 2 to 2 where about 70% of the tests that had been allowed were taken off the matrix so that a student had, couldn't use them after 2008, so that became more of an issue at that time. Um, and prior to that and after that, as far as if we took that away or with the new um, opportunities, it's less impactful uh, when they took the test. What's more important really so much of that is that if the test um, has been um, grandfathered out in any way. So there's two things that we said that we would do. What we felt that the effective date piece was so different for different tests and for different disciplines that we wanted the institutions to be able to make that decision. So, for instance, I have one faculty member who's adamant about not um, allowing non-faculty to put effective dates on anything that has to do with computer sciences. Um, so we respect that and say, okay. So computer science discipline could say, well, we accept this test for a year or whatever. Um, we just did that to keep those things clear at the institutional level, that we would let the institutions make those decisions based on the discipline. Um, another thing that we said we would do, and it's not currently on the interim matrix, but we create an archive of the tests and their um, effective dates. There are some of them, essentially, what the, the biggest difference between what you had before and what you have now is that most of those tests that, that were no longer um, allowed after 2008 are, are allowed now. And some names have changed, but the tests are now allowed. So um, that piece of it has been um, kind of, it's, it's moved because it's, it's allowed now. So, so we have an archive of tests, so the past names of tests, if someone took something 10 years ago, 
but we still felt that it was an institutional decision to decide if they thought that that knowledge and that learning was either relevant or could be rigorous enough or that it's a, you know, like the difference between somebody taking a computer test 10 years ago and somebody taking an English test 10 years ago and being out in the world and using their skills, um, we, we felt that it should be an institutional decision about that. So I'm hopeful that that answers your question. I've still got you on, Tiffany, what, do you have other, other thoughts about, about that? Um, I guess my concern would be that uh, I don't know that faculty really have the time or expertise to put into this to make these informed decisions on the standardized tests. I mean, that's a lot of a lot more that they would need to do in order to make informed decisions um, and come up with this in any amount of relevant time frame. Um, even within the next year, I feel like that would be a lot of rushed effort on their end. Um, I stand that they would definitely be the prime people to do it. I just I feel like if we're going to ask that of them, maybe there needs to be some training set up for that so that they're able to have the tools in their belt to make these informed decisions. That's good feedback. I'm wondering about, um, I think that's a good, I think it's good feedback. And I'm wondering about, I don't think that we would need to have faculty look at all of these tests. I think that there are some, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that there are some that are more sensitive to the time than others. And I think that part of what we had talked about um, as a group is that there are um, standard date frames a lot of times that people look at or that they, you know, to say like, a, you know, the, the cup tests are quote unquote good for a certain amount of time until that those follow through on most of the GT pathways types of courses, but that they would be different for the more technically oriented tests. I, I mean, I'm putting notes to myself here about that too, but um, I'd like you to think about that and, and like to think of it in specifically about what um, what that array of tests is and to say that it's, um, I think that standard practice is that 10 years on a test is um, acceptable. And we're looking on uh, research trying to see about that. And most institutions say 10 years, but it's on the ones that are GT non-technical, um, which we could do too with trying to get faculty involved in, at that level. But to say to those, the faculty at the technical level, and frankly, they're, they want to be involved, so I don't think it would be a big deal to get them involved, but to say to them, okay, so you want this to be a 10-year test, but how would you like to look at establishing a framework that works that you think is reasonable and kind of go from there? That would be true, too, for the AP and IB that are more technically oriented, I think. Um, so I have notes to myself about that. That's a great, that's a great question, and um, I think that um, it's also something that we can continue to have more conversation about. One of the things that I think that's important about this is that um, we make sure that um, we make decisions, but that we also know that as we're moving forward in the practice that we might hit some bumps that need to shift those decisions. The things that are in the manual are um, descriptions and um, um, guidelines on how to meet the policy and procedures. The manual is not the policy, and it's kind of the way that the handbook was treated in the past. But the manual says it's a way that we think we can do this. And if things come up to say, you know, that's not actually a good way or the best way, then we need to change that, and we can continue to have an open dialogue about that. The question was also from Tinny, um, and I'll go ahead and come back on and ask the question. Thank you. Um, let's see. Just finding my question I didn't realize I'd asked two in a row. Um, the JST and the PJST coding, when we're entering that into Banner, um, in the credit for a student, it makes it more difficult when we have both the JST and the JST credit on the same transcript. Um, do we do separate out, making it seem like there's two different transcripts, or should we put those all on coding. How, how would you like that handled best? This is a question, and I have actually heard this question before, and since it's a co-question, I'm going to put Ray Hess on the spot and ask him to um, discuss this. And, um, and I think they haven't had a chance to really meet yet about it, but he and um, Janet from Pikes Peak are having these conversations. So Rick, can you tell me what, what you might answer to that, that question? I think that um, in, indeed there can be um, a joint services transcript with um, with both of 
credit on it. Um, and it would involve, I think, I, I see it, it would involve probably two entries. One would be for the, just the JST for the elective credit that uh, uh, transcript evaluators only, you know, would evaluate. And uh, there would be another separate entry, uh, indeed for the same transcript, but another separate entry for the PJST credit, which the faculty had uh, had uh, evaluated. Is that in, Tiffany? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, great. Okay. The challenge here is to to um, kind of mute, unmute, and make sure that I'm not deleting anybody at the same time. If for some reason I accidentally drop you, it's not personal. It just happens. Um, okay. So what else? Let's, let's see some more. There's two good questions there. What else have we got? You use that chat box and click in and send it to all participants so we can all see it. And if you're identified or you don't want, um, you know, well, you kind of have to be identified if you're clicking in, but yeah, it would be helpful if you want to put it in. If you don't want to speak, that's okay. I can do it for you. That's not a problem. Any more other questions? There have to be other questions. I know kind of um, specific thing we looked at as far as issues are concerned and the questions that I have. have oh, we go. Can we? Okay, wait a minute. I've got one other one up here. So there. Thank, thank you. So Kristen, let me unmute you, and you can ask your question. Actually, Kelly's question, but I'll read it since I'm closer to the phone. Um, what she's saying is she's got a question about, about PACE. Currently, we don't accept transcripts directly from straighter lines, but we're a student to get an ACE transcript for those credits. Are we doing that now, and can the student send an official transcript directly from a company like straighter line? Uh, very good question. Many of you have probably heard about the ACE, ACP project, and how we have um, um, joined that as a system with is actually up to 70 some colleges now across the country where we did um, credit crosswalks on courses from what we're calling non-traditional providers like Straight Line, Sophia, edX, um, that are typically online, less expensive. Um, and we ended up we ended up as a, a group for, um, with faculty of approving about 40 of those courses. And what you can um, do for us and you can continue to do is to ask for the ACE um, ACE transcript, you, each one of you on your, and it's, this actually would help you probably if you want to go do this if you haven't seen it yet, each one of you has on your um, college website what's called a microsite for the ACE ACP project. If you go into your search in ACE ACP, it should pop, and then there'll be instructions there for the student, and I believe that those instructions require them to submit that transcript. And take a look at that and see if I'm wrong. I, it's important. If I am wrong, then we can talk about it. But they're um, generating a, a straight line transcript is not necessarily the um, uh, necessarily going to be the end of that for you. Mm -hmm. What? So, yeah. no. Have more questions on that, Kristen? Okay, hold on. Um, so basically saying that yes. Accepting them further as long as on there. One thing that we are accepting those courses and crosswalks that have been um, recommended by ACE and approved by our faculty in terms of direct crosswalk to CCNS courses. Except okay. we accept all ACE courses. So I think the way to keep that clean than anything is to say we need the ACE transcript. I'm not positive. I don't know, Thomas. Um, I'm going to mute you for a second, Kristen, and bring Thomas in on this. Thomas, do you have the answer to the question about whether they're going to get an ACE transcript for the ACE courses? You can go ahead. Yeah, it was my understanding that we needed the ACE transcript. Okay, and I thought that too. So, um, thing again, you know, if the, there's some of these things that, you know, that pops up that you actually think about or you see that we don't see. So if it does, you let us know and we'll figure it out. But I think that that, that was, I think that's the truth. And what we're after again on those is that we're using those ACE identifiers um, with the ADE ACP courses to actually have a, a, a um, code that's particular to them. It's like ACP something, or, you know, it depends on the course, but um, those who are prescribed will be able to see them better. So, um, Hopefully, be seeing that in, the, in getting it uh, appropriately. I'll tell you what, Kristen, I'll look into that and make sure that I have it right. And if not, I'll, I'll get a note out to the group to say this changed. But I believe we have to see an ACE 
transcript. They ought to credential themselves for this stuff. Um, once, uh, Wiley, I won't open yet their objective. I just want to know if we can get a copy of the manual. I'm going to be sending out an email, and my, my target is at the end of the day on Monday. That's going to contain a lot of things. It's getting sent out to anyone who participated in any of these webinars, and there's close to 200 of you. Um, in the email, you're going to get a copy of the draft manual. You're going to get a copy of the um, system procedures if I've finished getting them through legal. If not, you won't see those yet. But um, you'll get a copy of the policy, um, a couple other of the documents that go along with this work. Um, what I'm in the field to do, is, and I put this out in the introduction on Monday and Tuesday, I'm asking anyone who looks at it to take the manual for a two-week period for comment and asking you to go through it to look at it and to comment back on not to edit it, um, not to um, wordsmith it, but to send back commentary about what is or is not in there that you need, why it might not be accurate or clear enough, um, what types of information you need that we don't have in there that can help you do your jobs that can be more more um, clear. So you'll be getting all of that on Monday with an email that, that says this is what we're asking you to do and ask you to just directly respond back to me with any commentary that you have about it. Um, at the end of the period of review, which will be um, the 30th, um, we're going to take it back to the PLA committee for a final work conversation, wordsmithing, all the rest of that stuff. Then it will be going to, um, first it has to go through CCCS legal, and then it has to go to our provost and then to the president. And once that happens, then we'll be able to publish it. I'm I'm shooting for us to be able to have it finished by the time we're going into Christmas break so that we can publish in early January. We have a new prior learning assessment credit web page that's going to go up. It's under construction at the moment. And all of these documents will be in that. The stuff that you see now, if you're finding, if you find a handbook and all those other things, it's all the old stuff. We haven't posted any of the new things. so. Um, You'll see all that at the beginning of January. But the information that you need to do things is part of what we've been giving you in the last couple of months. So I, um, there's not a problem with not doing anything, you know, doing things correctly or whatever. Um, okay, so we have um, a question from um, Kristen's group. Hold on just a minute. I'm going to open you up. Okay, Kristen, you're unmuted. Hi, Lee, again. Hi, Kim. <laughs> Back to the effective day thing. Um, my not are since we are required to take credits, like say CCD transferred in a PLA credit, and then they decide to come to CCA, and I am required now to also accept that credit. Mm -hmm. it makes sense that we all have a extent matrix to follow with effective dates. Do you make it up to each school to make the determination? I mean, we should all be following the same rule if we're able to freely transfer from from what our CCS schools have determined to transfer in. Yes, it does. And you know, I, in my thinking about that, um, I agree with you. And um, what we what we really need to do is to. Um, which group to this to for kind of a definitive answer. It's not so much that we would make the decision around that. It's more about which group should I be putting together to make this decision. I think the registrar's group and our, perhaps the state faculty. Um, I'm not sure about that. But today, who makes that decision is kind of an important question. So I think that um, in, in terms of making sure that the student experience is the same college to college, making sure that you can trust more or have more trust in transfer credit from college to college. I think things like that in terms of consistencies is important. But a lot of what we've gotten preliminarily, at least in conversation, is there's many variables. And that doesn't necessarily mean that's true. It's just what we've been getting back for feedback. So. I'm open to trying to further, and I think it's a good idea to further that conversation out to a couple of the larger constituent groups to say what to do. If we're going to have an effective dates, um, have effective dates in the matrix, I'm inclined to really, um, not 
go through a giant process of review because I don't think that we'll get people to do it. We don't have the resources to pay people to do it. Um, and it's really more a matter of saying, I think, these are ones that could be problematic in terms of time. Um, so we're all on the same page as opposed to do we have to go through every single one of them. So I think that it's a very good idea and I think that we can move it forward. Um, but I'm, I'm feeling like I'd like to try to control that to some extent so that it doesn't turn into a year-long process. The other thing too is that um, depending on what CHE decides to do, I haven't, um, I haven't seen um, uh, yet in their conversations and the way that they're moving forward in their work and in their recommendations around the standardized test matrix. I haven't heard anybody say anything yet about effective dates. I don't doubt that that'll be part of the conversation. If they come out with statewide matrix that says that these are effective dates, then our, our work is done. We, we have to do whatever they say we have to do. So that may be a moot point, but i just put it down in my notes that we need to, to look and see if we can pull the constituent groups together to make that to have that conversation and make that decision. Uh, that um, I know you have a larger group in there, so I'll just kind of ask you specific notes. Do you, does that sound like a, a good way about doing this? I want, well, I don't know if it's going to be a moot point or not. If it's going to be a moot point, then it's like we have this old matrix that we were using and it wasn't doing the job, but it's sort of hang on to that to determine turn credits from the old matrix. I don't know. It just depends on how the conversation goes, I guess, and what they figure out. Yeah, and, and, and it's true. But I think too that the, the stuff that was on, you know, the things, most of the things that had effective dates on them in the old matrix um, had to do with the, either tests that were replaced or were um, updated and were um, those tests that were taken off of the opportunity list um, 2008. And I guess most of those have come back so that that 2008 doesn't have meaning anymore. Um, so that might help a little bit. But I, I think that the mind is kind of a comb combination of both. We need to have an historical record that says that if you took the test years ago and it was this test that it might or might not still relevant, um, but also that, um, you know, we are going to at some point. I I will know more as the like I'm I'm lurking the um, um, uh, council meetings to listen in on all the PLA conversations and then to talk with our leadership about it. So um, I I am listening for these things, but I haven't heard anything yet about effective dates. Um, so that I am kind of cautious about putting our people through a lot of work that might not be necessary. But at the same time, I think it's an important point. So. I'll talk with the leadership and the team around here and see if we can't come up with a, um, a way of talking to everybody to find out what maybe kind of some consensus is around that. And then if, if it's an interim choice around our interim matrix, I think it would be fine. The bottom line, you're right, is that we have to accept credit from each other and we need to be able to trust that. We need to know that we don't have to go, we don't want to have to be putting students through excess evaluation when they've already gone through it. So good, and thank you. Thank you very much. So we have one from Tiffany. Okay, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I, guess I wonder about errors taking this exam credit from each other's transcripts. Um, we are human after all, and I know that we are very good at what we do, but sometimes errors do happen. Um, I have seen the English split comp test transferred in as, um, I guess I meant to do this the other way around, but um, I've seen that transferred in backwards. It was actually the E-N-G slash L-A-N-G comp test transferred in as LIT 115. I'm sorry, Lang oh my goodness. Well, anyways, those two tests are very similar, the English LIT comp and English LANG comp, uh, the way they're posted on the CLEP transcripts. And I've seen them turned in um, directly only because I received the original CLEP transcripts and was able to compare it to the other schools' transcript that had already transferred it in. Um, <clears throat> so I do wonder, you know, I might make, you know, human error, and again, it is rare, but it does happen. Um, it just might compound the problem when we're not going from the original transcript. And, you know, that's typically why we always go from the original transcript, no matter what institution it's coming from. I understand that we're trying to make this easier on the student, but I would think the accuracy would be the most important. Um, 
I guess throwing that out there, and I just kind of want to hear some feedback on that, just some thoughts. If that's if okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to mute you back, and I'm going to say that um, you all have the opportunity to raise your hand. Do you want to have something to say about this? Let's just make this easier. If you have some, if you would like to address that, if there's someone here who's listening who would like to address that, go ahead and put your name in the chat, and I'll open you up. My inclination register is say that I would like us to tighten our practices enough so that it would be necessary and raise the relative effect on students having to be reassessed or reevaluated, so having to to produce a document again. And the number of times that this might happen. If it is actually a rare occurrence, I think the way that occurrence, um, you know, the, the how often that actually happens against the the rare impact of having all students have to reproduce documentation. The other thing about is, um, and this question for you guys, I'm not sure about this, but how um, we were in terms of capturing documents where the um, transcript could be part of the record that you then look at. I understand, I, I'm maybe way off base here, but I think that we have that, that capability where we scan in the documents. Documents are meant to be kept at the institutional level for these kinds of things. So if somebody transcleft credit <clears throat> um, at CC, it's, um, it, it doesn't the capability exist or isn't it? a requirement that you keep those documents in some way and perhaps if we kept them electronically attached to the student record that then if you something come in you can open it up and look at it without having to re um, connect to the student to do that. Can anybody jump in that one? Anybody have any thoughts on that? You can try not to answer questions that are really your questions to answer or your questions to discuss. I'm going to unmute Rick and pick on you again. Talk to me about this Rick. Um. Actually, uh, you know, it's really a registrar question, but but as far as I know, at the yeah, each individual college now is um, imaging. As far as I know, those records, those base documents, like like transfers, for example. And while theoretically, I suppose it'd be possible at some point, using the you know the magic of electronics, to uh, allow other schools to have access to that. Right now, if if uh, for example, at Front Range, we scan a CLEP transcript. Uh, range, as far as I know, is the only uh, college that has uh, access to to see that scanned uh, transcript. As far as the way exists, that if you know, with like to to Timmy's point, that if there was some concern that maybe it wasn't transcripted properly, that one institution could, could request a copy of that from the other institution. The receiving institution could ask for it from the transfer institution. Uh, yeah, I think I think they could certainly do that, but the question would be, how, you know, how would you know which might be you know, an error. I mean, you're so concerned about everything being, you know, possibly being an error. That would mean you'd have to request every, you know, source transcript from the other institution. Right. Conceivable. And and again, if if it were possible that that all colleges had access to these scanned documents from all the other colleges, then it wouldn't be you know, such a big deal. But um, uh, it would be kind of problematic to set that up. It, uh, it seems like. I think might be a Janelle question too about their capability. Is it possible to allow those documents to be attached to particular things and open to the world, in, as opposed to having documents shared? I know that that's a core banner um, thing. That, that it's reasonable to say that all of the documents at one institution would be shared around all of the institutions. I think that that's a that's something that will ever happen. But I wonder about that. So. It's a good question, and let's continue to like kind of chew on that a little bit and see what I'm after is: are there efficiencies that we can create that don't require excessive evaluation from the student or excessive um, effort from the student? So, bottom line in the policy says we accept that credit, so we will accept that credit. Um, it's not going to be a matter of saying we do or we don't, which is some, something in the past. You know, I don't like, like your, pro your program does something, so I'm not going to accept our version of whatever class it is. That's not going to happen anymore. What we could look at is to say, um, you know, how can we in some way create an efficiency that doesn't require the student to have to do that every time um, and extra, you know, to, to in any way be up on some of these barriers that we've been trying to remove for students. So 
I put down here for myself that that's another that's going to be a, an important thing. I think a lot of this, a lot of these questions really need to be discussed through the registrar's group who have the, the highest level of knowledge around um, what it does or doesn't do, and um, you know, and to talk at the catalog level with our folks here about what what are we able to do and not able to do. I think important. Um, these questions. So, um, questions we have um, a little bit of time. One of the I thought about or just to ask about is that are, are there any other things that you see in what you've heard about, like this thing, anything pop in your mind about while wow, that could be a problem or we want to do that or that's going to create a lot of work for me. Um, you know, the, the committee will tell you that from the get go, what I've been looking at here is to take kind of a a, a messy system and to create some efficiencies that allow us to stop duplicating, that allow us to um, uh, be much more focused on the way that we gather and transcript data um, so that we can have more information to work with, we can have more tools to work with. Um, are there other parts of this process that you see as being heavily time consuming that we just haven't looked at or that we really need to be able to um, get a deeper conversation about? Is there something, you know, are there any big holes or any gaping holes that we've created that you need us? to be looking at anything like that. We've got a whole, I know we've had two people ask questions. So I know that the rest of you have questions. You're going to ask them in the last three minutes, right? Take a while some time for the question to come through. Does it have any thoughts about this in terms of positives? I mean, I know that we always kind of go at it as a, a problem solution kind of a thing, but I feel pretty strongly that this is a great thing for students, and I'm trying to sell it that way, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are. Do you see this as a positive for students? Do you see this as a as a real um, for us in in helping them to um, connect to our institutions? I'm going to just a couple more minutes to to see if there are any other questions, anything else, or any comments even, any commentary. So when we do bring the key back together, most of the colleges have representatives. Some of you not. If you're interested in being at a committee meeting, you're welcome to attend. We're not a closed group. Um, if you are interested in, in being part of that, we'll only meet a, probably a couple more times um, before we're finished with our charge. But if you wanted to send an email to me and um, get on that list to be invited to those meetings, you let me know. I'd be happy to have you come. Um, the last pieces of what we're doing have to do with finishing up the manual. Um, um, and um, really just kind of uh, going back and making sure we haven't missed anything. Look to me like I'm not getting any more questions. Um, I appreciate that you all took the time to join in today. If you do have questions that you didn't want to answer with the group, please feel free to send me email. Um, just at bitsy, dot cone at cccs.eu. Um, if you're um, part of either of the other two constituent groups, um, we'll go ahead and, and um, visit with you later on in the day. Um, we ask about effective dates on each of these new policies that we are beginning to implement written into the upcoming manual. The effective dates for this policy, there's only the one policy, and it's a, it, the effective date for the policy was actually in 1989, but this is a, a revised uh, origin on the policy, and the effective date was February 13th, 2015. Um, as far as the rest of it is concerned, it's, um, you know, it moves forward from that policy. The effective date on the interim um, matrix would be the only other thing, and I don't remember when we sent that out, but that was the effective. It was sent out by um, Dr. Migler, um with Janelle. So I'll double check on that and put it into the um, trim into the um, manual, but the policy is February 13th, 2015. Well, thank you all very much for joining today. Um, I appreciate your time and I'm really interested in any kind of feedback that you can um, give me so that I can work with the group that, you know, I see myself as a facilitator of this process. So if, if there are things that we need to be touching on and looking at that you want us to know about, please, please communicate with me. And um, we're working really hard to make sure that you get all the information you need. And if you've, you're thinking that that's not happening, it's real okay to say to me, wait a minute, you're not getting me that information, and I will do my best. Uh, we have a protocol that we follow in terms of getting information out to the colleges that starts with the vice presidents, um, and there's a request that the vice president share out that, that information. And I know that that's not always the case,
but I do it that way first, and I typically will wait a week or so and then send out to whatever constituent groups that are involved in whatever the process is to make sure that you get it. So I'll, I'll try to continue following that practice. Um, and you can share with each other, too, to make sure that we're covering all the bases. So I'm going to close this out. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you for um, letting me work on this process with you. I think it's awesome work. I appreciate it.